Division in the Body of Christ, Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Reformation. So you can see a little rundown here. Christianity begins, it's rooted in Judaism. And eventually after the Council of Jerusalem at Antioch, uh, people refer to themselves for the first time as uniquely Christian. And here we have the dominant symbol of Catholic Christians. And we learned about the first major break within Christianity with the uh, Greek-speaking church or the Eastern Orthodox churches. And then we have here the second major break within Christianity, Protestant Christianity depicted by its symbol, the uh, naked cross without the corpus or body of Christ on it. So what has happened to this one body of Christ division? Our question is, how is it that people who call themselves Christians can divide? Is it accidents of history? Is it theological, doctrinal? Is it pride? It really can run the gamut. So in regards to the second major break, I'm going to walk us through uh, one, the cause of the division, two, what's an indulgence, three, the effect, the big picture, and four, the effect, the Council of Trent. So the cause. We're looking at uh, the time, start of the 1500s, uh, where Rome, Wittenberg, which is in Saxony, uh, in Germany. Uh, remember when referring to Germany here, um, it helps you and me in the modern mind put into uh, context to place it. However, the modern German state does not exist until the 1870s. This is uh, all in Christendom at the time, right? So major events going on to give it uh, more of a historical background to kind of work on cause and effect. We see that Gutenberg's printing press had recently been invented. The Bible is becoming uh, available to more because literacy is going up. There's a rise of a middle class, the merchants, and also with all these things comes a rise in nationalism. Uh, people are starting to identify more with the local king rather than the uh, bishop of Rome or the pope. However, the church is more stable due to institutional reforms and its organizational structure uh, as you read about the College of Cardinals. So the abuse of the teaching on indulgences is the spark that lit the powder keg. It's not the sole reason, but again, the spark. Uh, when the religious revolt came, it found most ardent support from those who had most to gain from a break with the Pope and the Church, like King Henry VIII, who despised Luther but wanted his way and ended up getting all the lands that the Church uh, uh, owned, the monasteries. So major players, uh, and then we have the occupation part. We have Pope Leo X, pictured to the right here by Raphael, this beautiful painting. Uh, leader of the Roman Catholic Church. He's building St. Peter's Basilica because the uh, one built by Constantine, Emperor Constantine, was uh, falling apart. He was vain in terms of uh, personality. And it, into the Renaissance, you know, arts and lavish goods. Now, Albert, where uh, Luther was from, he's the Archbishop of Mainz. Uh, Character-wise, he was, you know, passes the buck. If he dealt with uh, Luther and the issues locally, probably be learning a different history right now. But instead, he passed the buck. He swept it under the rug. He, he'd do anything to kind of keep it uh, from the ears of other powers. And it kind of built up uh, Luther's frustrations. So Luther was an Augustinian priest university theology professor, and he was sick of the immorality in the church. Uh, Personality-wise, he always felt that he can please God, that he was first and foremost a sinner, and he could never uh, 
really had difficulty receiving God's grace. Uh, Frederick is a Duke of Saxony and has Luther's back. He's pleased with the publicity and he stays neutral on theological matters because that's not his area of expertise. And Tetzel was a Dominican priest. Uh, Thomas Aquinas would probably roll over in his grave if he knew about Tetzel and what he was doing. He was manipulating the church teaching on indulgence to uh, fill the coffers for the church. Uh, here we can see a pamphlet from Germany, 1517, that concludes that Tetzel's stuff and the Pope's fraud are not accepted as right and justice where we live. So what is an indulgence? Um, it does not take place of, but is connected to the sacrament of reconciliation. According to the Catechism, an indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church, which, as a minister of redemption, dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the sac satisfactions of Christ and the saints. So there are two types. There's plenary and impartial. Um, so the church has always had a teaching on indulgence. However, you can see what happened at this time in history was it was manipulated, it was abused for uh, earthly gain, right? And... Uh, very kind of similar to people's understanding of predestination with uh, Calvin, which you guys read about. The church has always had a teaching on predestination. However, unlike Calvin and his theology and his understanding, uh, the church has always taught that we are more inclined to go to heaven because we are created by God and created for God. So what about King Henry VIII? Uh, as I alluded to early on, the king despised Luther and his movement, even granted by the Pope the title Defender of the, of the Faith. He really saw himself as an amateur theologian. At the heart of the issue was he wanted an annulment due to he and his wife's Catherine of Aragon inability to have a male heir. So he used theology in defense. Pope Clement VII will say no. And the Church of Rome in England will become the Church of England, with the uh, monarch as the head. Three, the effect, the big picture. Luther speaks out against church injustices, his uh, infamous 95 Theses. Uh, Zwingli, Calvin, Henry VIII, and others found Protestant denominations. They can't agree with one another. Uh, sides are chosen with uh, local monarchs uh, who side with uh, the Protestant movements. And uh, those who remain with the Catholics and the, or the Catholic Church. And uh, eventually, you guys read about the Peasants' War and the nastiness there. Um, the Church will eventually respond in uh, Trent, Italy, uh, at the Council of Trent between 1545 to 1565. Uh, but many will argue that it's uh, too little, too late because the time had gone and the wounds that had been caused and the violence that ensued. Uh, the Council of Trent, you may encounter this in your readings and studies, or it's also known as a Catholic Re Reformation or the Counter-Reformation. So four, the effect of reform movements. The Council of Trent, uh, the bishops of the church will meet off and on at Trent for uh, between 1545 and 1563, called by Pope Paul III. It's the 19th of the 21 ecumenical councils in the life of the church, and its task will be to define certain dogma and doctrines of the church more clearly to avoid uh, abuse and misunderstandings and misapplications responded to issues brought by those protesting within the church and the results of this will be decisions will guide the church for three plus centuries and uh, it'll be the second major break in the body of Christ so the teachings reaffirmed at Trent faith is based on scripture and tradition as you've learned freshman year in Theology 3A. The church is the final interpreter of meaning in the Bible. Uh, Latin will remain the universal language. 
Salvation is through faith and good works, inspired by faith. The validity of all seven sacraments. And the Eucharist is the real presence. Uh, the philosophical explanation, transubstantiation. Not just a memorial, what Luther uh, would coin consubstantiation. Celibacy will be upheld as the ideal. Bishops must live in their diocese, not party in Paris and then return home maybe once a year or in some other major city. Uh, they had to actually live there for the majority of the year. Be close to their people, whom they shepherd. Bishops must eliminate abuses surrounding indulgences. More seminaries will be founded for the... Um, Education and training of future priests. Commission composed a missal that standardized prayers and rituals of the Mass. And the Catechism will be uh, developed to, again, lessen confusion. A uh, list of forbidden books, prayers for priests known as a breviary will be uh, published. So I just want to end on a hopeful note because it's a lot to take in. Uh, it might seem that this uh, body of Christ uh, will never return to uh, united one. Cardinal Bea, Secretariat for Christian Unity, October 15, 1962. My dear brothers in Christ, the incommensurable grace of baptism, which has established bonds that are indestructible, stronger than all our divisions, so this, I think, is what leads into Second Vatican Council and will be at the heart of ecumenic, ecumenism. Okay, what do the Christian denominations have in common? Uh, stressing the commonalities rather than the differences. December 1965 at Jerusalem, Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras will issue a joint statement of their sincere mutual desire for reconciliation. Both the pontiff and the patriarch will lift the excommunications that their predecessors had uh, doled out. March 22, 1966, Pope Paul VI and Michael Ramsey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, a predominant leader in the Anglican Church or the Church of England will issue joint declaration of cooperation. In it, it acknowledges shared spiritual and liturgical heritage and the hope of both leaders is for full communion in faith and sacramental life. In October 31st, 2016, the Joint Declaration for the 500th Anniversary of the Reformation. The Joint Declaration will effectively close the centuries-old faith versus works debate by merging the Lutheran and Catholic views on salvation rather than setting them against each other. And uh, Tom Hennigan writes in his article, noted at the bottom here, By grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part. Its key passage said, We are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, who renews our hearts while equipping us and calling us to good works. So I end on a very hopeful note for the future. <laughs>